I didn't quite know what I was going to talk about and I gave this title to Steve some time ago and, um, and then last week decided I'd better write my talk and so uh, it actually wasn't quite as easy as I thought but, um, but what I've done is put down some ideas about medical research career paths and I think there's a lot of people in the audience who probably know as much about it as I do. Um, but I thought it was useful to have that discussion and I also recognise there's some younger people in the audience um, for whom this might be helpful. So I guess in, in the talk what I'm really doing is asking two questions and, th and that is are, are we as sort of research leaders providing the right environment and advice for the next generation of medical researchers? And then to the, med the people who are considering that career what are the opportunities and which ones give you the best um, chances for success? So, uh, so I've tried to balance both of those questions um, given that there's probably a bit of a dichotomy in the audience here. So one of the questions is why do medical research, and Ingrid I think, and you know Ingrid actually has stolen quite a bit of my thunder in her talk, um, but gave a, a really good talk about some fantastic research, but also then why would you go down that path? And, uh, and I guess if, if, if we think about why, why do medical research, I mean one of the most important reasons is people. Uh, in a whole lot of different ways. The people that you work with and the people that hopefully you're going to help by doing your medical research. Um, I think fulfillment's important uh, and it is a career where the ultimate goal is obviously uh, one of importance and, uh, and it is fulfilling to try and get to that goal and uh, even if you hit a few roadblocks, as well, I mean I thought that was a great talk because it's really important that people understand there are roadblocks along the way and you're almost there and then someone trumps you and it's really important to understand that happens in, in medical research. I, I think that it's, it's a creative area and, uh, and one where creativity and innovation are, are very important and actually they're two words that we're starting to hear again in the political environment and I'm really hopeful that the political environment will improve and understand how important those two words are in, uh, in it, both uh, health development and economic development. If people think, and, I, uh, and I'm sure there's lots of people in the audience who think about their own medical research career, and, and it is one where you can be flexible, where, you, where really you, a lot of it's self-driven and you can decide on a day-to-day -day basis, even on a week-to-week -week basis, um, what, what you're going to do. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about my men one of my mentors, Diane Griffin, um, but she used to say to me, you know, she loved medical research because she could get in on Monday morning and decide what things she was going to do during that week, what problems she was going to solve and what experiments she was going to run. And, and she just loved that sort of degree of flexibility. Lots of travel, lots of, as I mentioned, and in the travel you meet people and ultimately uh, impact. I, I think from um, the sector, I think we probably haven't been selling the excitement and fun in medical research and I, I, and I get a lot of people coming and talking to me about whether a medical research career is one that they should go down, mainly with concerns about sustainability and money and other things, but really it's all about excitement and fun I think and we really do have to sell that. Um, I will mention as I go through a little bit about our translation centre and uh, I congratulate you guys on your translation centre. We had this night on Monday um, where we asked uh, people doing science and degrees and other degrees around Adelaide to come and, uh, and think about whether they wanted to do a degree that helps to move science directly into clinical care and we tried very hard on Monday night. We got 300 uh, odd students coming into our building talking about the excitement of taking science into clinical medicine. And, uh, and we added a bit of fun by giving lots of beer and pizza out and uh, also had the opportunity to win, a, win an Apple Watch. And uh, so we wanted to add, you know, bring fun and the excitement together and actually it was a, it was a terrific night. What do you need if you're going to enter um, a medical research career? Clearly you need passion, clearly you have to be passionate about what you're going to do and uh, I think as an example in Ingrid's talk we really, we really heard about that. You need to have drive, I mean I think you need, it's, it, it is a hard road and, uh, and drive and persistence are, are really important um, to get over those bumps. Creativity 
as I talked about. Um, but the point I perhaps wanted to make on this slide was that I think the traditional skills we look at for people entering um, medical research careers are, are really important and Ingrid made a really good case um, for the clinician researcher, um, one where there's a diminishing number and we need more clinician researchers. Science degree is also a really good uh, underpinning for a health and medical research career. But I think what we should also be looking at and encouraging is people coming from engineering or maths or computing or social science into health and medical research. I think the social sciences, we've done that over time and I'll mention a little bit about HIV but the social sciences and behavioural research has been really important in the prevention strategies around HIV. Um, but as we need more people in bioinformatics, we need more people understanding uh, the bioengineering needs, um, computing, uh, I think you know a very large percentage of the people in our organisations are going to be computational biologists rather than laboratory biologists and all those skills I think are, are really important and I think you can come into health and medical research with those primary skills and still do extraordinarily well and medical research can benefit from you joining. So I think we're, we're actually not very good as a sector at attracting the non-traditional candidates into medical research and, and I think we have to try a lot harder to get those into our areas. And finally, you also need luck and I think our last story emphasised that a little bit. When, when to start, so here I just wanted to make the case um, that, it's, that it's actually never too late and I think there are, uh, there's been a strong emphasis on putting research into undergraduate, undergraduate courses, a strong emphasis putting it into medical courses and I absolutely support that and think that's terrific. But there's lots of people who don't know that they want to do medical research and only sort of trip over it later in their, in their careers and have done extraordinarily well. There's an enormous number of case studies where that, that's happened, um, where people have an emphasis on clinical training as, as an example and don't really think about um, the, the research aspects until they've finished their FRACPs, for instance. Um, lots of people in those non-traditional areas who haven't thought about it. And, and I, I'm not sure that early is necessarily better. And I think that if you develop some alternative skill bases before entering health and medical research, and one example I would give is primary care. We don't have enough primary care clinicians in medical research. I think having a really strong primary care um, background, I think, will be increasingly valued and important as we try and make our health system sustainable. Economics. Uh, re really, really important and some of the health economics people we've attracted to SAMRI have been, just been outstanding in that area. IT and informatics as, as I mentioned. And, and so again I would argue that we need to work out better ways for the system to accommodate non-traditional pathways into health and medical research and not always assume that an 18 year old is going to decide on a, on a medical research pathway and go in a linear fashion um, all the way. How do, you, how do you choose um, your area? Um, clearly, and this is where I think the entering it slightly later is probably a good idea because you, you can actually make a rational decision about the areas that you think are important and, and what you're passionate about. Uh, I think it has to be an area in which you think you can make a difference and ultimately you will need that passion and enthusiasm to drive your research over those bumps in the road. Um, I don't think it necessarily, I mean, people again come and talk a lot about what's, what's the hot area, should I be going into, you know, bioinformatics, should I be going into um, the, the microbiome area or whatever, because they just happen to be, you know, the last 10 Nature, uh, Journals of Nature has an article about um, the microbiome in the, uh, I really like the microbiome by the way, but um, it, I don't think it has to, has to be a hot area. Um, <coughs> And I don't think you can predict what will be a new and emerging area. And, I, and I'll just give a little example. When we think about HIV AIDS, when, when I graduated from medicine, um, we didn't actually know what, we didn't know the words HIV AIDS. And um, so uh, 33 years ago, the first case um, was described. 
And any of you who watched the Peter Allen program would have seen some of that history with, with Peter Allen, actually. Um, but, um, but over the, so it, it wasn't a hot area then, but those people who were involved in virology and neurovirology and um, all the aspects of, of HIV were not in those areas because they thought it was a hot area and that HIV was going to take off. Um, but over that period, because of high quality science, because of community involvement, act, and importantly, really active translation, going from not knowing what the cause of a disease was to drugs that now are very effective and have turned it into a chronic disease, to the bioscience of prevention and exciting prevention strategies, um, that, that wasn't predicted. So, I mean, I think if you choose an area that you're passionate about, you will make a difference in that area and you don't know how that area is going to impinge on, on, on any other area. And, uh, and the same might apply, I think, if you think about Ingrid's talk about mTOR. There are people who have been doing the basic science of mTOR for a long time, not knowing that that was going to be a critical pathway in epilepsy. Um, so I think they're, they're really, uh, in, that's a really important point, I think. What, what, where, where, would, where would you start, where would you go to start your health and medical research career? And, um, and I think uh, that, like a lot of things, if you're going to go and play footy and you want to win a grand final, you'd probably join Hawthorne, um, unfortunately. Uh, where's Haddon? Oh, there he is. <laughs> um, so we'll get an Adelaide team in the grand final again soon. Um, but you need to start with a team with strength. They need to have strong science. They need to have funding to make sure that the start of your career has sustainability. They need to be experienced in understanding health and medical research. And also importantly, they need to be great people because you don't want to work with people you don't like. Um, the infrastructure needs to be there and health and medical science is strongly de um, developed on top of great infrastructure. So in, in the end, great science is about great people and, uh, and, and great infrastructure. I think it's ideal if there's interdisciplinary possibilities, collaborative opportunities. Um, ideally, if you can collaborate with people that are better than you are, then you'll do better research. And transla translational links. And I guess that, that this slide is really about highlighting the importance of precincts and academic health science centres and networks. And uh, obviously, uh, and this is, I've, these are old slides because I found them on my computer from, uh, from way back, but I'm sure you've got better AMREP slides now. But AMREP, I think, is a really good example of a precinct that, um, that can offer you, um, you know, a whole lot of areas of strength and then a whole lot of uh, pillars to support those strengths. Again, an old slide. I'm sure you've improved this now, Steve. Um, but, uh, and, and really learn, and I think AMREP was, well, I think it was really the first um, precinct to really develop this in a, in a really strong manner. And uh, certainly we've tried at SAMRI um, to, to emulate quite a lot of, uh, of what uh, was happening here. We've tried to um, bring together the infrastructure, the translational aspects and the bioscience to allow people to join SAMRI and have really strong health and medical research careers. Uh, and again, I think it's important in these precincts that they identify the strengths that they're going to work on so people can understand by coming to a, a precinct or an organisation, you go into one of these areas because they're the areas of strength that that organisation is uh, offering you. Um, there's collaboration across those areas and also across the pillars um, that support that organisation. You can see that diagram looks a little bit like the AMREP diagram. Um, I don't think there was a patent on it at that point. Um, and I, I, I just want to make a plug for the NH and MRC Advanced Health Research and Translation Centres because again I think they are identifying bringing together the um, key players that allow them to, for careers in health and medical research to be supported and sustained. Um, by uh, an active group of, of peers, by the infrastructure that they bring together and the translational opportunities that they, uh, that they bring together. 
And, uh, and so, as I mentioned in the pre slide a few slides ago, our centre has worked very hard on trying to develop a, a, a view on workforce, so a view on how we develop a clinical and clinical research um, workforce, um, particularly obviously for South Australia, but also for Australia. And, uh, and precincts are important, so, um, so this is my uh, plug for our, our precinct in Adelaide. And uh, you can see there the Samri building in the middle of it, um, the new Royal Adelaide Hospital, which will, uh, which will open next year with eight, 800 single, bed, single rooms, um, the University of South Australia, the University of Adelaide research buildings on the same precinct, and then the Women's and Children's Hospital joining the precinct. And again, I think like AMREP, you bring together you know, some institutes, some universities, and a hospital, you start to have a geography that also allows you know, uh, high quality health and medical research and also uh, enables um, career development in, in the area. So I think both in terms of the translation centres in um, the model, but also the geography, I think is, uh, is uh, critically important. So the, the um, pr how do you, you get into health and medical research? You start along your career, Obviously, as I mentioned, the area you choose is important, so that's predominantly around choosing a PhD or clinical research experience or an MPH. That's, that's clearly a key decision, but actually I think the next decision is the, is the most important, and that is once you've done that sort of postgraduate degree, where do you go from there? And your postdoc, I think, is a really key decision. I think you really need to grab hold of your mentors, uh, and role models and talk a lot about where your postdoc is and uh, on the next slide I'll talk a little bit about international issues um, and you need to think about wh what are the areas and what are the skills that you're going to be strong in um, by taking on on that particular particular postdoc. Um, I personally think international experience is really important. I know it's sometimes difficult and, uh, and gender comes into that and families and all sorts of things, but I think even if you can't go for a prolonged postdoc, I would really say we as uh, uh, research leaders should be encouraging um, international experience. You, you embrace different cultures. The impact actually lasts your entire career and I'm sure if we talk to people in the audience the thing they remember most is their international experience. Um, and we'll you know, go to dinner parties and they'll talk for hours about it. Um, and, um, but I also think um, developing country experience can also be very powerful. So my postdoc was at Johns Hopkins and, uh, and really you, you do learn a different culture and you see a model that is extraordinarily successful and you take the best um, best from that model, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I talk about mentors. Um, well, I'm talking about it now, sorry. Um, so when I, when I arrived at, at Hopkins, I'd done infectious diseases training and a PhD. I was an average clinician and a pretty poor scientist, to be honest. Um, and really, I don't think I had a lot of understanding how really good science was done or what the competition was like. And I came to this place, and as you saw on the previous side, slide, an organisation that was getting $500 million a year in NIH funding, ranked number one in both NIH funding and number one hospital in the US. But, um, but very quickly, you, um, you, you learn an enormous amount. And I had a, a great neurovirology training there. My virology and molecular and neuroscience got better. I didn't get much better as a clinician. Um, and, uh, but I really got a very good understanding of how good science was done and, uh, and started to understand that um, Hopkins culture. And uh, as they say at Hopkins, I drank the Kool-Aid. Um, but I, had, I then had a model in my mind of what a seriously good research intensive academic and clinical institution could be. And, uh, and again, I'd re-emphasise that I think that's what's also happened at, at AMREP and uh, at different places uh, and hope around the country and hopefully in, in, in Adelaide. 
I, I also spent a little bit, little bit of time in Papua New Guinea, not an awful lot of time, but um, worked, as, uh, worked up in the Goroko Base Hospital for a while. And again, I think that that also influences your view and influences, uh, certainly influenced me to think about how health and medical research could, could help um, resource poor countries as well as resource rich countries. And so the need for appropriate biotechnology, and I think in the case of HIV, the, uh, the need for what we did and learnt in the developing world, in the developed world, sorry, in Australia and the US, to be um, delivered uh, in the Pacific, in Southeast Asia, and obviously in Africa. So the other issue that often comes up and heavily debated in NHMRC when people apply for fellowships uh, or even program grants or project grants is this issue of independence versus the team. And, um, and I think I'm just going to give a personal view here that obviously we, we need independence of thought and contribution. We need people who plan their research careers and know where they're going and work out what they need to get there. But we don't necessarily need people to move quickly into leading totally independent groups in, and particularly in under-resourced areas. Uh, or under, uh, um, by under-resourced, I mean lacking the infrastructure and the sustainability. So I would argue that we should, need, we should be continually supporting people who are in strong groups, who are supported, uh, in a, who are in a well-supported environment, who have the, which has the resources to, make, to enable them to do outstanding research. And, uh, and over time, they will, through the independence of their thought and contribution, become research leaders. Um, and I think that's a bit of a problem and there's a bit of confusion in that area in the way we're allocating uh, research funding, fellowships and, and training awards. Um, out of that, though, I also think that um, research leadership is critical and uh, I'm not sure that we do know or, even, or do support the development of research leadership uh, amongst our, our um, junior staff. And I, I think that's, uh, it's, you know, it's sort of um, do one, see one, teach one sort of philosophy that, you know, you'll see it and then you'll learn how to do it. But uh, I, I would like to see a whole lot more formal training in research leadership going on in the sector. And, uh, and an important question is to ask, are our research groups sustainable? Can they support someone's career along and through um, this bit of the research career challenge? And that is that area where people are grappling with independence and the success of the team. Mentoring and role models, I think this is a really important. And again, you know, Ingrid pointed out how important it was I think role models have a huge uh, impact on our careers for, for a long period. Uh, I think if you can find multiple role models, I think that's, that's even better. I think mentoring's being identified as increasingly important and is now being organised by universities. I know through the new Australian Academy of Health and Medical Science that we're very uh, keen on developing a mentoring program, particularly for those involved in translational um, research and I think mentoring and identification of role models is, is really has to be a priority in the development of the next lot of, uh, of leaders in the area. So I, I actually uh, earlier this year went back to Baltimore um, for Diane Griffin who ran the lab that I worked out at Hopkins um, for, for her retirement and this was one of the slides that I I used at that to give a talk at that time and um, so I was really it made me think about why Diane Griffin had such a big impact on me and uh, and it was really again it was really her as a role model she you know I just watched what she did she supported her people and I put an included transport and accommodation because I strongly remember I arrived in Baltimore about one o'clock in the morning with three children and Teresa and Diane picked us up at the airport and took, her to her, took us to her house. Um, but she, she was a role model as a clinician scientist. 
She collected great people into her lab, was very collaborative, had an open door policy, was all about researchers having autonomy. And there's a whole lot of things there, and I remember writing this slide and thinking, well, actually, they're the things that I now value. And, uh, and so they were really things that I got from Diane and now value when I, when I look at other people. Uh, Ingrid mentioned gender. Uh, I think uh, it, it's a, clearly an issue. And if you look at the, um, the graphs which show how many people enter medical research, it's about 50-50. How many people lead uh, institutes or uh, uh, professors, as Ingrid put it, or in other um, senior leadership positions, very few are, are women. And I think there's a whole lot of reasons that Ingrid put up um, for that and we need to do something about it, uh, absolutely. And uh, I think SAGE is a really important part of that, led by the Australian Academy of Science and the NHMRC. And there's a pilot of, uh, of the Athena Swan Charter starting with 35 organisations joining that pilot, um, uh, SAMRI being one of them, um, to try and, and change this. And uh, I think that's really important. I also do think that, and having been on a few panels with NHMRC lately, that we are acknowledging career interruptions better and we are measuring outputs and outcomes by opportunity. So I, I, I think that that is improving, um, but I do think gender equity and accommodating career interruptions is very easy to talk about, but actually really hard to do well and, uh, and an area that we must, must do well. So just coming to the end, what do I think are the, are the most important ingredients? And I'm sure everyone in the audience will have a different view, but passion and persistence, obviously in the individual are really, really important. I think role models and mentoring, uh, I, I don't think any of us can uh, develop a health and medical research career without those. Planning with an understanding of the steps that are required to be, be successful and planning for those steps. And then uh, equally important to the top four is the environment. And I think and have advocated for a long time that academic health <coughs> science centres are the right environment for translational research. Um, because they do contain excellence, they contain great people, they have the infrastructure, they have the translational culture, and as, as was pointed out, I think Big Pharma know that too, that they, they are looking to academic medical centres and biotechs for the pipeline that they don't have themselves. So, um, because you need the, all of that environment for that pipeline to work. And, uh, and then finally, you need, uh, you need luck. So, I'll stop there, Steve, and uh, thank you very much again for inviting me.